Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, the Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show. This is the inaugural edition, the first edition, and this is your host, Jason Hartman. Thanks so much for joining us today. You may know me because I am host of several other shows on the internet, several other big podcasts, most notably the Creating Wealth Show, but also the Young Wealth Show and the Holistic Survival Show as well. So you're probably listeners to that, and that's how you heard about the Jet Setter Show. And the Jet Setter Show was really created for those people who consider themselves to be citizens of the world. And regardless of what country it is in which you reside currently, you want to look at the world from a global perspective. You might consider being a dual citizen of multiple countries. You might consider investing overseas. You want to be aware of the best tax shelters, legal tax shelters, by the way, nothing illegal going on here, nothing crazy. But there are business opportunities and tax shelter opportunities around the world, which are very interesting. I've been fascinated with these different things as I've read about them and heard about them over the years. And we'll explore those during this show. So it'll be very interesting. Today on our first show, we have the Global Property Guide. The head of that will be talking about real estate opportunities around the globe. And it's a fairly lengthy interview, about 50 minutes long. So we will get to that right after this quick message. If you want to be a successful investor, you need to learn the truth about where to invest and how to create wealth from someone who does it successfully every day. Jason Hartman. And Jason's number one piece of advice? Pretend the stock market doesn't exist. Thousands of people are growing wealthy by pulling their money out of the stock market and putting it into what has proven year after year to be history's best investment, rental property. And now Jason has developed the Creating Wealth online course, a six-week intensive interactive webinar that teaches you exactly what steps to take to begin investing in rental properties immediately. And you'll get intensive real estate training, no esoteric theory, just a simple, repeatable, conservative approach that can make you very wealthy. Classes are online and priced at just $197. Register for the Creating Wealth online course at www.jasonhartman.com. It's my pleasure to welcome Matthew Montague Pollock to the show. He is the head of Global Property Guide, which is a tremendous website that offers a lot of resources on real estate data for investors worldwide. And as you know from listening to prior shows, I say that all real estate is local and just the U.S. in and of itself is such a large market consisting of about 400 different metropolitan statistical areas. You can imagine how large the entire planet is. So there's a lot out there. And Matthew will bring some of his insights and wisdom and research to us today. Thanks for having me on the show, Jason. I want to give our listeners real data and certainly the big bubble called Dubai just popped. And I knew that was a frothy bubble. I hired a uh, a Middle East consultant to come into my business and tell us how we could get into that market, not to recommend properties, but to take advantage of getting buyers to buy U.S. properties from there. And maybe, Matthew, we can kind of start. You've just got such great research and really just a wealth of data here. Maybe we can kind of just sort of look around the whole planet and touch on each area. Okay. Uh, and, and we'll start okay. maybe, let's start down under with Australia and kind of go up to Asia and Europe and Russia and so forth. Well, both Australia and New Zealand are kind of unusual in the world because they're doing relatively well at the moment. And that is, after having dipped down, that is because of low interest rates, of course. And that is that is something you're going to see all over the world and you are already seeing in many countries that low interest rates are uh, are going to push push property prices up but here is the reason essentially 
for my global pessimism, <laughs> okay. which is that it is true that low interest rates, obviously attractive to go into a market where the cost of owning a property is less than the cost of renting a property. This is the sort of basic dividing line which tends to push markets up. And when interest rates go down, the cost of owning uh, falls and becomes lower. But we have to say that the reason why the gov governments around the world are keeping interest rates low is, of course, the fallout from the bubble has pushed all these all economies all around the world into deep trouble. And it's for the wider good of the economy that the interest rates are being kept low. And there will come a time, as there is now coming in Australia, when interest rates will go back up. And generally, around the world, and including Australia and New Zealand, we do not see yet that property prices have fallen enough to justify a happy investor-based strategy. By happy investor-based strategy, I mean something where you know it really makes sense. You know that in the long time, these properties are underpriced, and you know that eventually you will have capital gains. Now, 10 years ago, <laughs> we had this situation absolutely around the world because interest rates had fallen down to very low uh, rates, and yet you could get in many countries gross rental yields of 10%. Now, you know that if you're getting a gross rental yield, that is, on every million dollars you have invested, you're getting 100,000 gross per annum in return. You know that this makes sense because it's better than any other kind of investment. And that in the long run, what this will do will be attract people into the market and your property price will go up. So you're going to get income and you're going to get capital gains. This has to make sense. And indeed, it did make sense right the way around the world for investors, and that was why we had the boom. Now, in the present situation, we're just not in that situation. What we have is a temporary situation where interest rates are low, therefore it seems to make sense to buy. But in fact, property prices have not, in most countries, dropped enough for that happy investor certainty to return, that it really makes sense. And of course, invest, uh, and of course interest rates are going to be heading up. So we, as a property research site, have to say to people, well, I'm sorry, wait. <laughs> you know, keep put your money elsewhere, put it in, in the bank, wait for three or four years for most of the world because in most of the world now is not the time. And, and in many countries, you have really disastrous situations. And one thing we know about real estate property is that it's not like the stock market. The stock market drops one day and tomorrow you can say, wow, dropped 40 percent let's get back in the property markets as we're now seeing just don't work like that they work as professor schiller has has taught us over the last 15 years with his really revolutionary path making research they work in nice slow long cycles on the whole and the cycle you can see when the markets are undervalued you have 10 to 15 years the cycle goes up in a nice slow rush boom, it then becomes obvious the market is overvalued. You wait. People don't like selling. So the, the down rush of the cycle is very slow on the whole. People will not sell below what they bought if they can possibly avoid it. And so inflation has to do a lot of the work getting those property prices back down. But it takes a long time. That's the typical situation. So we are sort of stuck saying, hang on, wait. There's, in this game, we don't think, on the whole, there tend to be opportunities where you have to say, I'll buy this week because tomorrow it won't be there, because these things happen very slowly. You have time to sit, think, watch, look. And on the whole, when you want to get into a market, you can get in one year and you can get in the next year. And better to get in after it's begun to start going up again. Right. And I, I definitely agree with you that most of the world is just over leveraged on this frothy debt bubble and prices went up way too high. However, I do believe that this was particularly sensitive in markets that did not previously even offer mortgage financing. And I'll tell you why I say this. I have, just so you know, I have traveled extensively. I've been to almost 60 different countries 
countries. And I took a Eastern European real estate tour shortly after becoming familiar with your site, actually. And I went to Romania, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Germany, which is where I was born, and looked around at properties. And they were just, they had just started getting mortgage financing at the time I was there. Whereas before, buyers always had to pay cash. Mortgages were kind of a foreign idea. Yeah. In yeah, well, market, I, I, yeah, that's, that's an true. amazing and difference. I think yeah. That's very interesting to you say that. I mean, I think it obviously is true that one of the reasons why developing markets tend to have high gross rental yields. I mean, if you click around our site, you can go through the continents and you can click on the things and you can see we put we have a team of researchers who look at all the different markets and look at the prices per square foot of properties and the, and the rentals per square foot of properties. And we put them in a nice table and you can click at the top of the table saying, oh, which country pays the highest gross, gross rental yield on this continent? And one of the rules of thumb, very simple, is that developing countries pay better gross rental yields than developed markets. Now, you could say, if you were a stock market analyst, you would say, well, this is because they are riskier. It's a small cap stock, in other words, right? Uh, and I had a great difficulty two or three years ago persuading my researchers not always to put buys on the United States <laughs> and developed countries because, uh, I mean, we are, we are based in a developing country, and my researchers, had, had to, and they are well aware of developing country risks and they always think, well, it's got to be safer in places like the U.S. And then we had, and I said, well, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> then we had the, the big bubble burst. And part of the reasons why developing countries are always more attractively priced is because people find it difficult to buy in them because they can't get the mortgage financing. And a transition point comes, as it did in Eastern Europe, when suddenly whoosh, the financial systems modernize, the legal systems sort of kick into gear more or less, and you can get mortgage financing. And over a, a period of a decade or 15 years, it really brings, pushes the prices up and brings those rental yields down. And in my view, this is another reason why developing markets tend to be quite attractive places to buy in. Yeah, I think you're right. They do have they do have in many ways more risk with them, but there are opportunities out there, no question. Can you explain, because you have a different way of calculating it than most of my listeners are in the U.S., although they are scattered throughout the world as well, rental yields. Can you just tell the listeners what a rental yield is and, and how you calculate that? It's very simple. We just take the the, the the monthly rent that you are, that we we do the gross rental yield because frankly although we have on our site calculations of taxes it's very difficult to be to accurately deduct taxes so we do the gross rental yield so if, let's say you're earning a thousand dollars a year from the apartment we take that figure one thousand dollars a month times twelve let's say the purchase price is a hundred thousand you've got twelve percent return now so you can see that's a very good return, and you're not going to get that, I don't think, anywhere in the U.S. But there are countries out there where those returns are not untypical. Oh, well, actually, you know, Matthew, I'm sorry, I, sh I shouldn't have agreed with yeah. that last statement, because you can now easily get 12% rental yield in the U.S., but you can't can you? get it in... Well, you don't get it in the markets that make the news. Like, you don't get right. that in, in any of the major markets like California, New York. When I say New York, I'm referring to the city, by the way, not the state. Right. But, you know, certainly you can get that in the what I call sort of the linear, less sexy markets that aren't really in the news. I mean, we get that all the time, so that's that's not hard at all. But, yes, in the in the markets that make the headlines... You right. can't. You don't so, get those kind of deals at all. The yeah. Are you talking about places like Detroit, or are you talking well, about small places? No, I don't like Detroit at all. <laughs> but I am talking <laughs> about, for example, Dallas and Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, uh, Austin, t Texas, to a slightly lesser degree. Certainly, Indianapolis, which is a fantastic cash flow market, but not good for the appreciation as much. And so, there's a trade-off that investors have to make between the potential for future appreciation, which around most of the world is just not there too much now, and, yeah. and certainly not in the U.S., and monthly cash flow or rental yields. So, so, so those two interplay together. I mean, our belief is always that, uh, and you may think it's simplistic, but we do tend to believe that if the rental yield is 
very high, that will tend in the long run to pay bonuses in terms of price appreciation just because people will be drawn into the market by the attractions of the rental yield. Right. I mean, it doesn't always happen, of course, and there are markets where historically you've always had low rental yields because for, for various reasons, but that's what we tend to believe. I'm very impressed and surprised that actually that there are such high rental yields to be had. Well, again, this is buying bank-owned properties in Atlanta and Dallas and Indianapolis and many other markets that are really a little bit under value. They just have great cash flow because the problem we have in the U.S. is that everything here practically is credit-based, unlike the rest of the world. And so when people can't get mortgages, they're forced to rent. And it's fairly hard to get a mortgage now. And that's really what made our market what it is. It's it's this whole house of cards called debt, <laughs> imprudent debt. I think the important thing I'd really like to get back to, if we could, is just going around the world a little bit and yep. looking at like some of these regions like Asia. I mean, what's what's going on in Asia, for example? Well, what's going on in the leading countries in Asia is that you have countries which are structurally safe, like the small ones, like Hong Kong and Singapore, where people feel completely confident confident that the place isn't going to go away, there's not going to be some terrible disaster in the government, the getting, buying and selling is very, very easy, the legal systems are very strong, and there is quite a lot of flight money from the surrounding countries, Chinese, ethnic Chinese in Indonesia and mainland Chinese who want to be out of their own system investing in in Hong Kong. And these have, for the last 15 years, had high prices relative to their rents, in other words, low rental yields. And the arrival of relatively low interest rates after the crash has given a final push to these markets. So both Hong Kong and Singapore are seeing themselves in new bubble mode for the last quarter, two quarters. And in Singapore, the authorities are becoming very concerned. And they actually have an uh, interest rate system which allows them to detach from the U.S. interest rate. And I think that they will be pushing their interest rates up. And I also think that they will be taking direct measures uh, the government is is a, is a very strong and authoritarian government, and they can essentially tell their banks to stop lending. Uh, and I think that they will be they have given every indication that they intend to do that. So I think you'll see the the end of uh, of that. In China, you also have a return of the bubble. You've had a very strong appreciation of property prices in China. That the Chinese authorities followed the crisis with an absolutely enormous spending, infrastructure spending program, which is bigger than anything you could imagine and anything that has uh, happened uh, yet and was a very impressive demonstration of how decisive the Chinese can be and, and really how well run the place is, actually. And the result has been that the housing market having uh, fallen into crisis and many de- developers having gone uh, gone down is now sizzling uh, with activity. And over the last six years, we've seen gross rental yields fall from about 10 9% to about 5%, I believe. It is typical in China. Now, uh, even lower, 4, 4%. Shanghai, I see we got it on 3.5%. So that is a danger signal. I mean, after all, China... In China, you can build anything anywhere, and people will just go on. Developers will just go on building. There's no strong building regulations, uh, none of that. So, infinite number of apartments can go up. So, buying at a rental yield of of 3.5, 4 percent uh, doesn't make sense to me if you're looking at uh, either uh, rental rental returns or gains. And actually, I mean, China uh, anyway is a country where foreigners cannot buy at the moment. I mean, I'm just talking about it too to indicate a case. So that's that's what's happening. Japan is in its traditional uh, sort of stagnation mode. Property prices uh, seemed like they were recovering a bit just before the the big bubble burst and they've been, they've been coming down again. Uh, rental yields have never been very attractive, but they're at sort of 6% in the in the in the centers, which is not bad. There's been a couple of pieces of legislation which uh, which actually have have 
clamped down on developers, so that's good for the markets. But Japan is always going to be, it's never going to be easy for a foreigner to buy in. <laughs> uh, the Japanese. Japanese are very insular. Do, that's an insular society. They like to do yeah. their things their own way. And I think it would be a, a brave foreigner who would get off a plane one day and say, I'm here to buy for investment purposes, he'd find... In I Japan. Mean, <laughs> yeah. On paper, everything works fine and right. is normal, but in practice, you'll find it's it's kind of difficult. Uh, and then there's the, the, the developing markets of Indonesia and Philippines and Thailand. Now, Thailand, of course, has always been very attractive to foreigners because of its beaches, etc. But it's quite expensive most parts of Thailand. The problem has been politics. Over the last four to five years, there's just been a hopeless deterioration in the political situation with a continuous struggle between the, pop, uh, the, the populist Prime Minister Taksin Shinawat, who was ousted by a coup, and the so-called Democrats, the partisans of the king. The Democrats are marginally cleaner, more urban, more literate, more educated. Shinawatra's guys, marginally more democratic, more rural, and more corrupt. But these two camps cannot tolerate each other. <laughs> and it's now become a them versus us emotional issue, which tends to routinely to paralyze the airports as major demonstrations take hold. And it's hard for investors to feel comfortable in that kind of thing. So that has spooked Thailand, and I think will go on spooking Thailand, because there doesn't seem to be a way out of it. In the Philippines and Indonesia, if you look at our tables, you will see what looks on the surface of it to be a very, very attractive investment situation, because the rental returns are excellent in both countries. They're at 12 percent. But this is slightly illusory because the taxes on buying and sell properties can be very, very high. Basically, you're going to lose 20 to 25 percent of your investment as you go in and out of the place. And so we think there's not much point in that, that you have to consider the taxation situation and that the superficial, look, just looking at the returns, doesn't give you the, the true picture. So we're quite, although every time we do that, we run the rental yields pictures, they, these countries show up at the, at the top, we never advise buying in them because of yeah, and, and I should mention for the listeners, Matthew, that you are coming to us today from the Philippines. From uh, the that, Philippines. That's where you're based. I'm afraid so. So we are, we are on the phone long distance here. So looking at, and I'd also like you to touch on, maybe you could just go back real quickly to very generally Asia and Australia, New Zealand, the Pacific area region, as you put it, the landlord friendliness issue. We try to always recommend properties in areas that are more friendly to the landlord's cause than the tenant's cause, and that's a big deal because if you're in a place like, uh, and I'll use the U.S. as an example, California and New York, yeah. you're pretty landlord unfriendly. The, the tenant can squat in your property. The tenant can make life difficult for you. Whereas if you're in Texas, for example, uh, that's just one of many, the laws and regulations are pretty friendly for the landlord and not right. as much for the tenant. And, and this makes a big difference as to the uh, look at Germany, for example, is very tenant friendly. So not right. a lot of people want to be a landlord in Germany, even though the numbers, as you mentioned, mentioned with the Philippines, they kind of make sense, but maybe the laws don't. So touch on the landlord friendliness issue, if you would. Yeah, well, throughout Asia, the, the uh, landlords are, are well protected. And there is, I don't think, anywhere where the courts take a very sympathetic attitude to, towards tenants. In Thailand, it tends to be uh, as simple as if a landlord has a problem, he goes and asks the policeman down the road to do something about it. <laughs> wow. <policeman> will appear. <laughs> That's almost vigilante <laughs> level, yeah. <laughs> and tell his tenant where to get off. Yeah, in, in the Philippines, the landlords tend to be in a, in a very, very strong position, the same, in a, the same in Indonesia, the same in Hong Kong, and the same in Singapore. I would assume that in Australia, the landlord isn't in such a favorable position. I'm less familiar with the Australian landlord and tenant situation. Uh -huh. 
actually, but I would I would imagine you're right. We've got to ha have a quick look on our site <laughs> and see see what it says. Let me just get up the page because on our site we have pages for land on tenant, and you can just go and look up in the countries. Right. And what it says here. And uh, you know, I'm always a little bit skeptical of my own site, and always slightly du double think it is this really right. But it says landlord and tenant laws in Australia are neutral between landlord and tenant. Oh, okay, okay. So not uh, both right. skewed one way or the other. Yeah. Now, what about uh, talk to us about the markets in Europe and Russia, if you would? I mean, there's so many markets, so that's a huge region, obviously. But yeah, I, I would assume uh, Russia and Eastern Europe are riddled with corruption, and I felt in Eastern Europe it was very frothy and the prices were very high, and yeah. I was not interested in investing there. Of course, you've had the Baltic states collapse. And that is uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And I, I suppose your, your listeners know, know about that. That is the most extraordinary situation because real estate prices have actually fallen 60% across that region. And it's no it's no surprise, really, because when I was there, you could just tell that the bubble was in the making. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what do you do in that kind of situation? You have a, a frothy market which has collapsed. Do you rush in and say, wow, it's gone down 60%. So it may be the uh, time. Let's get yeah. in here and buy. Well, no, you do not, because the impact of the 60% fall is to completely spook the economy for at least the next five years. Right. Because the banking system has collapsed and you can't run an economy without a banking system. So um, unfortunately, these places do not present opportunities. What they will present, they will present an opportunity in four to five years' time because the, the, the psychology of these things is, oh, God, this terrible disaster has happened to us. It's the worst thing that's ever happened in our lives. We'll never get out of it. Gloom sets in, and this is great for the investor. But eventually, the economy does revive, and you'll have opportunity. But uh, it's not the case now, and it's not the case in Russia, and it's not the case in Ukraine, certainly, which is undergoing a big collapse. It's not the case in Slovakia, which, is, which was relatively reasonably priced, but is now... It just somehow Slovakia didn't get overbuilt like the rest of the country. It's small enough, I don't know what it was, but it just it didn't get overbuilt. But it is heading down Romania and Bulgaria in the same situation. Hungar Hungary is heading down. We think that... Hungary, which has had huge problems and incompetent uh, budget management for a decade, current account deficits, etc. The socialist prime minister famously resigned after it was revealed that he'd run a campaign based on what he knew were lies about the economy. Uh, Amazing. And we, <laughs> we, we think that um, Hungary may be an opportunity. The gross rental yields are, are, are looking quite attractive, and we think it's beginning to be somewhere where you might think of coming back. And we also think that Poland may be beginning to uh, have opportunities. Poland is attractive partly because it seems to be one of those countries which is achieving economic dynamism in the midst of of the mess of the post-communist restructuring. Yeah, I was I was actually reasonably pleased with Poland last time yeah, I was there. Yeah, I told yeah. my people in Poland that it's it's not very high profile, but you are finding a lot of small local investors and small landlords buying in properties because just because the returns, the rental returns, are so good. Well, that's that's a very attractive reason for for doing it. Uh, we have. Only six percent as our gross rental yield in Poland, which is which is not, you know, what I would normally consider a, a, a buy signal. Whereas on on Budapest in Hungary we have eight percent, which is which is very good, of course. That's it. Now the the rest of the uh, of the continent we are kind of uh, gloomy about. I mean, Spain and Ireland, obviously, they've had their enormous hit. This will go on forever and ever. Particularly in Spain, the banking system has collapsed. There are hundreds of thousands of apartments sitting around the, the country empty, and this will go on Italy, although rent growth, it hasn't had a collapse because it never had a boom. Prices are, have been stable and continue stable. But uh, Italy is in a long-term economic doldrums. It is not growing. It will not grow. From the outside, I don't quite understand why that is, but I think 
the, the usual answer is structural reform. They haven't got themselves together. Well, property markets, all property markets, reflect in the long term economic growth. If you have a growing economy, your a property market will go up in value. Italy has been growing for 12 years at under 1% GDP growth. There's no point in buying in Italy, even though actually the, the, the whole country is relatively underhoused. You know, this is a country where young people still live with their parents because they can't, they can't get properties. But the economic growth story is against it. Germany, as you say, you have quite long, strong uh, landlord uh, protections. You also have a very unfriendly tax environment for the foreigner who is taxed at a different rate to the local. The local also gets tax benefits if he buys new properties. He can set this money against future income tax. And that is one reason why Germany was intended to be bought into. But uh, as a foreigner, you're disadvantaged. Belgium has uh, tax problems. And uh, the UK is still, in my view, uh, not attractive uh, in terms of uh, valuation. I mean, the tax situation is okay, the in and out returns are okay, but you're buying into a country where the property is nearly as high in price terms as it was at the peak of the bubble, and interest rates are very low. Is this going to last? I don't think so. A lot of these Western European countries really have population problems, too, population decline problems, and that is a huge yeah. weight on the real estate market. I mean, just a huge weight. Very bad news for real estate. Yeah, well, of course, that, that brings up the whole immigration issue. I mean, part of the reason why the UK's property markets were pushed up was that they, they have very strict building rigs, but they had allowed a lot of, a lot of immigrants to come in. And that obviously puts upward pressure on, on house prices in, in urban centers. The political outrage against immigration is now very, very strong throughout Europe because, I mean, unlike U.S., these have not traditionally been immigrant-accepting countries, and it was not part of the national ideology that we, were, we welcomed your poor, your huddled masses throughout the world into the country. And people are suddenly waking up and finding that 12% of the population are immigrants and a larger proportion of children are children of immigrants. And people are saying, well, did we decide this? Is this what we wanted? And often the answer is no. What happens to the housing market is going to be partly an issue of what happens to those, to those immigration doors. Personally, I think the modern world is stuck with immigration. It's very hard to say, to, to bring down the walls now, especially in something like Europe, where uh, you set up a, a, a sort of a federal country, essentially, in which there is free travel within most of Europe. How can you, how can you restrict immigration unless you unstitch the whole thing? Matthew, I know that your time is somewhat limited, and I just want to make sure we kind of cover this broad stroke of the yeah. different the different regions and continents. I'm not giving you enough real estate. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's uh, I absolutely everything you're saying is very interesting. Let's let's go to the Middle East. Middle East. You want to go there because the Dubai bubble just yeah. popped, and and then let's jump down to Africa real quick and over to the Americas. Okay. Now, in the Middle East, although you've had this enormous collapse in Dubai, which, as you say, was clearly predictable. Although some said it wasn't. <laughs> they they thought, said it wasn't. You know, you know what, Matthew? It's so interesting because every time you're in the midst of a bubble, you always talk yeah. to people, and hopefully they're not yourself, <laughs> but you always yeah. talk to people, and they always have a bunch of reason why, a bunch of reasons why this time it's different, <laughs> and it's never yeah. different. It's always the same thing, the specular frenzy. Well, know? that's yeah. why I believe in looking at rental, gross rental yields. Couldn't I agree mean, of more. Course, yeah. Dubai was different because you had this huge overbuilding. But the fact was that the year before, in the two years before the bubble burst, property prices went up, rents did not go up sufficiently, and you had gross rental yields come down from 10% to 5%, okay? This is the strongest sell signal you can imagine, <laughs> especially when you know there's millions of properties waiting on the sideline for those renters who no longer exist. So for us, this was a absolutely slam dunk case. You know, We think that in much of the Middle East, the situation is not good. I mean, there are countries like Jordan and, would you believe it, Lebanon, where which have seen enormous property price appreciations in the last three to four years. Lebanon has been booming, and Jordan has been booming, and they have partly been booming because of the Iraq refugee 
issue. A lot of Iraqis came out of those countries with money and settled themselves in apartments in these in these places. And we think that the boom is more or less over. I mean, it doesn't make sense that you're earning 3% in Lebanon when its southern neighbor could could bomb the city any day from the next because of something that Hezbollah has done. So you're in a fundamentally insecure situation. The yield has to be very high for a bomb threat. The yield has to be very high <laughs> yeah. to compensate for sure. that. But uh, we've, we have always liked Egypt. The reason is that in some bits of Cairo, you can get very, very good returns. I'm not talking about the coastal resorts, which, of course, are like coastal resorts everywhere in the world. The cost of building is rather low. People have been coming in on airplanes from Europe. There are huge numbers of properties, and it's all overbuilt. And in a holiday destination, it's hard to get a tenant who's going to pay rent on a regular basis. But our guide is partly interested in capital cities where you can get expatriate renters. This is our, personally our, my sort of ideal renter. You're in a capital city, you get a foreigner. You know the foreigner's going to leave. You know that he's a middle class or upper middle, upper middle class person so he can pay the rent. He's probably there because his company is put him there or his embassy is putting him there or whatever. This is the ideal tenant. And in Cairo, you can get that tenant. He will pay you 12% rent. You won't have to pay any tax on it. You can get him out, and it's very satisfactory. And uh, so we think that that's a, a good thing. We also think Morocco remains attractive because although it's a Muslim country, although, frankly, the hassle level continues high if you're a foreign woman, this is a country which the Europeans have taken to their hearts as a beach uh, and uh, exotica destination, you know, Fez, Marrakesh, these cities are uh, very strange, very medieval cities. You can pop stars are uh, buying in these cities, in these in these old houses. I've been to Marrakesh, and Marrakesh is in Morocco, and Richard Branson has a huge estate there uh, as well. Right. I, I remember some of the people I was with went to visit his facility. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You could get in, could you? Well, they could. They had a special connection through Young Entrepreneurs Organization. I yeah. Yeah, well, you, you you can live in this sort of feudal way in these in these riads, which are sort of private, almost private villages with courtyards, uh, where you can pretend to lord it over your harem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of, uh, so, did we cover the Middle East? Uh, we sort of covered the Middle East. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we also think Tunisia is Tunisia is 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 an interesting market. It's it's not history, but it's beaches. The Europeans like it. The rental yields are not great, but we think it's it's quite peaceful and it's got a long-term future. Want to jump down to Africa now? I mean, you, you were in Egypt already, so we might as well, uh, and, and Morocco. You, you've done sort of the northern Africa. Do you want to talk about the rest of it? Yeah, we hardly cover, we don't cover much of Africa. We find it difficult to cover more or less all we cover is South Africa. What's going on down there? They had a huge run-up during the expansion of credit. They just had a, a big run-up. I assume that bubble has burst, but I don't know much about it. I, I, I was there about four years ago, I it think. It burst more or less the beginning of 2008, and I have to confess that we haven't refreshed it since. So I I haven't been following that market. Let, let's go over to the Americas then. I, I'm particularly interested. I really want to hear your take on Brazil because I'm. I think Brazil yeah. has an interesting future, uh, maybe a very positive one. I'm not sure what you're going to say, but I'm looking at Brazil and just want to know what you think about it. We have long been very positive on Latin America, and we think it's a good thing. Uh, not everywhere, obviously. We've been very, very keen on Uruguay. We've been quite keen on Brazil. We probably got that a bit wrong, frankly, because we were attracted by the, the very high returns that we could get in, in, in Uruguay. But I think that Brazil is a story which is really, although it's been bubbling for the last three years, I think it is, it is continuing. There's great growth. There's, we see in Sao Paulo, we see rental returns of 7%, which is kind of acceptable, and we're in favor of it. We just think a, a, a growth process seems to have been set off by, by a, a very sensible government. So I would agree with you there, and I think that the boom has got quite a long way to, to run. 
Now, can I ask you something about Brazil particularly? I was yeah. in I was very keen on Argentina until I visited about 2 years ago and it seemed like the bubble had definitely burst. There was no financing whatsoever, at least for foreigners. I I don't think there was any mortgage financing at all, although there used to be. I thought it was very expensive relatively speaking. But with Brazil, I remember seeing a report on CNBC and this was early in i guess 2008 before the credit bubble had burst later in the in the year and they said brazil for the first time got mortgage financing they had never had it before and they talked about how there was a huge shortage of housing there was a lot of construction coming up and i got really interested in brazil and i assume that the mortgage financing has gone away or at least been diminished yeah. substantially since the credit bubble burst yeah i have to say that i cannot answer your question and this is, uh, you have put into my head a real irritation, which is that we find it very hard to, we do all these other figures around the world, but we find it very hard to do mortgage financing. There is no global source of mortgage financing information. The thing changes all the time. It's very hard to keep tabs off. But I'm, since you've asked me that question, I'm going to find an answer. Okay, good, good. We'd love to know. Yeah, <laughs> but that's I can't a... give you an answer okay. now. But okay, it's sure. just so frustrating because, as you say, when mortgage financing, financing becomes available, markets change dramatically. So I, I just don't know the answer, but very interesting. Uh, fair enough. Okay, so anything else in Latin America, and then we'll go to North America? Well, we America think, and... uh, I mean, Colombia, although if, you can, uh, if you're happy to get kid kidnapped, we think Colombia's good. Oh, Matthew, <laughs> now you know the kidnapping rate in Colombia is down 78%, <laughs> which <laughs> isn't saying much. Yeah, well, you know, the Uribe is, is, is getting it right. Uh, so we are positive on Colombia. It's got, uh, Cartagena's got history, and the, the country is enormous. And it's got a reform momentum from this very ambiguous government, which is sort of in the pocket of the right wing, but at the same time does seem to be doing things right. We also think that Peru, uh, did you go to Peru on your travels to Lima? I mean, it's not a tourist destination, no. Lima, because Lima is such an unpleasant city because of the permanent cloud of humid smog which hangs right. over it. But this is a popping economy. Is that sans drug trade? No, no, that's not. No, know, no, 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 no. I know this, that made is, it pop. This is genuine growth. I don't, know, I don't quite know what it is, but it, but it, the economy is growing very fast, and the returns are great. There's, there's a lot of construction, and I think that this is genuine growth. And I think that if you were just buying for capital appreciation and rental returns, Lima would be a place to look. Uh, Argentina, we have, we've always been against because the government went into a crazy fiscal irresponsibility mode and the thing was unsustainable and that has continued. Chile, we see kind of uh, reasonable returns, but the, the growth rate of Chile seems to have slowed a lot uh, over the last decade. And it's not going to be a country that that people get excited about for coming from outside, I think. So we've never been very uh, excited about it. Want to wrap up on North America? Uh, North America, well, as I say, we are not the experts on North America. Well, I think that you are reaching the stage of the cycle where within the next year, 18 months, people should consider buying again and that those less sexy markets are exactly the markets where you want to consider buying into. Canada, of course, is, is bubbling away uh, and uh, did not have the big hit that the U.S. Ha had, and, and a lot of Canada is doing very well. Now, do you attribute the Canadian issue to the oil sands at all, or is that just the, the general Canadian economy? I think it's the general Canadian economy. I think that they were a lot less leverage than, than in the U.S. I, I would assume Canada is pretty landlord unfriendly, though. They have such socialist leanings up there. That would just be my assumption. I may be wrong. Yeah, Canadian tenancy institutions are pro-tenant. You're, you're right. And there are, like the U.S., there are great differences in areas which we, we, we deal with on our site. And some bits of the country are extremely unfriendly. There's a page on there which where you can take a look at the, le the legislation, but it's basically unfriendly. Anything else on North America? And then just kind of wrap this all up. Of course, the website is globalpropertyguide.com, and you have a tremendous amount of research there. Anything else on North America, though? Not that I can think of. I just think North America is a cyclical story. You went into the, you went into the, uh, the problems earlier than anyone else. You are emerging earlier than anyone else. 
And you have seen tremendous price drops around the country. And I think that, as you say, in selected markets, this is an opportunity. That's, that's my take on, on, on North America. What's your take on, on the entire world, other than that you're not too positive, <laughs> like we started the interview with? Any just sort of general thoughts for investors? Well, general thoughts, uh, this is a timing game. And you do have to choose the time in, 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 in which you go in. And it is no good. Of course, real estate is great as a category, and it's great as a diversification. We, in fact, had a family tragedy in which uh, an, uh, an uncle of mine was caught up by one of these scamsters in California and lost most of his money. And part of the thing is, if he'd been invested in his own real estate, this would not have happened. You know, more or less, that you own this thing, and it re re remains a resource for you. And I think that that is very, very reassuring in a world where so often you're, you're dealing through complex financial structures and you don't quite understand what people are doing with it. And uh, before the crisis, I often had people saying, well, I don't understand. Why would anyone want to go through the hassle of buying property themselves when they can buy a real estate investment fund? Well, the answer is, you know what you're getting. You can go and visit it occasionally. You know, you know exactly what it is. You can see the rents come in. You don't have a, a layer of other people to deal with. And I think that that is a great thing. The other side of that is any real estate investor cannot do it investing as a category. You have to go and see. You have to go and touch it. You have to go and see that the apartment that you are buying is one or the, the property that is one that you would like to live in. That out of the windows you see a view the swimming pool is nice. All these things, it's near to schools. It, all these sort of feel and smell tests, incredibly important. I personally never buy property myself. I'm too indecisive and I can't do it. I have a wife. <laughs> uh, okay, so you're outsourcing. She's your investment manager. Then, yeah. And she has the instincts. She can say, uh, no. I don't think so. Well, I'm glad you said that, and I think that's a great way to wrap up, Matthew, because in my Ten Commandments of Successful Investing, rule number three is thou shalt maintain control. Invest in your own stuff. It amazes me the ignorance of people in just handing their money over to these uh, Wall Street crooks, these investment managers, and if they're not crooks... Well, they talk a good talk. Oh, they That's talk a great talk. They've got a great marketing scheme, but if they're not crooks, they might be incompetent. If they're not incompetent, they're taking a huge management fee off the top. You have no control. Just do your own stuff. No, I agree. Uh, yeah. You look at it on paper and buying your, uh, your own home doesn't seem to make sense, but you have the control. You know what you're getting. This is very important. Well, that's a good thing. Thank you so much, Matthew. I, I appreciate your insights today, and we've gone a little long. I know you need to run. So thank you for joining us, and we'll have you back on in the future. I'd like to hear how this things pan out as, as time goes on, maybe in six months or something. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you very okay. much, Jason. Bye-bye. It's very nice to be on your show. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. Opinions of guests are their own. Jason Hartman is acting as president of Platinum Properties Investor Network exclusively. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.